All right, so the important question that everybody should be asking is, what is there, what evidence is there that doing any of these plyometric exercises together with some of these um, nutritional interventions is actually going to improve running economy? We've seen changes in rate of force development with hydrolyzed collagen and with epicatic and rich cocoa. But how does that translate to changes in running economy, changes in performance? So the study that I gave you, the paper that I gave you, this Pavlovian study, basically what they did is they took good 5K runners. So, so they're basically, you know, as we'll see in the next slide, they're, they're running, you know, 15 to 17 minute 5Ks. So that's pretty good. They're, they're not going to be Olympic or international levels, but they're very high quality runners. And they either had them continue their, their training as normal, or they took out some of their distance running and they added plyometric exercises, jumps, bounds, um, you know, sprints, little things that are just designed to to increase the plyometric load across the muscles. And then what they did is they did a couple of measures. And the most important one in here is this VO2 at 15 kilometers per hour. Again, this is a measure of movement economy or running economy because it's how much oxygen are you using at, to run a certain speed. Okay, and what you can see is in the control group, their, their running economy didn't change across the nine weeks of training. If you look at the plyometric group, however, you see that there's a rapid decrease in the amount of oxygen it takes them to, to run 15 kilometers an hour. And that decrease is maintained, if not accentuated, over the nine weeks. And so what this tells us is that when we do plyometric speed, all of these types of training, what we're doing is we're increasing our, our, the economy that we, we run with. And what that is, is that as we do these plyometric trains, we're increasing the passive stiffness. Increased passive stiffness is gonna result in an improvement in running economy. What does it do to performance? <clears throat> well, you can see here that these, from the Pavlovian study, again, the controls, they, they ran the same speed throughout the whole thing, around 18 minutes. I gave them a little too much credit in the last, uh, you know, when I was initially talked about it, they're 18 minute 5K runners. Again, it's good time, not great time. So it's just under six minutes per mile. Okay, now if they added plyometric training in, what happens is they go from this 18 and a half minutes down to a little bit like 17, 1745. So what you can see is that in the controls that just continue training the same way that they've been training, there's no improvement in performance. In the plyometric training where you've shifted training, you've added these plyometric sessions that are gonna increase stiffness, that are going to drive an improvement in running economy, what you can see is that there's an improvement in performance at both the six and the nine week time period. Okay, so what this shows us is that plyometric training is going to increase stiffness, increase stiffness, increase running economy, increase running economy, increase endurance performance, okay? So, so those things together are going to give us this idea that we can alter our stiffness and our performance simply by adding plyometric training. If you now go back and you add the nutritional interventions, you can probably drive this even further. So what are the limitations with all of this? And what are the, what are the constraints? And how is it that some people respond really quickly and beautifully and don't see injuries and other people respond really badly, slowly, or they do see injuries? Well, a lot of that comes down to your genetics. And there's a number of different genes that have been shown to be related to injury. The first one that was shown related to injury was um, a paper by George McConey. And George is a, George is a, a Botswanan um, individual who did his PhD in, in, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And what he did there is he took about 500 people who are runners, who they have... Um, training history on and they have genetics on. So they took mouse swabs, they did genetic analysis. And what he discovered was that if you had either 12 or 14 GT repeats in your tenacity C gene, what, you, what he found is that if you had 12 repeats, you, had a, you were twice as likely to have an Achilles tendon injury than to not have an Achilles tendon injury. If you had 14 repeats, you were 10 times more likely to have an Achilles tendon injury than to not have an Achilles tendon injury. So simply by changing the number of these little repeats in this region, and you can think of these GT repeats as maybe in increasing or decreasing the, the um, openness of the tenacin C gene. And so the interesting thing is if 
It's the even numbers that seem to be bad for you because the odd numbers, 13 and 17, if you have 13 repeats, you have less than half, you're less than half as likely to have an injury as to not have an injury. If you have 17 repeats, again, you're, you're about half, maybe about a third the chance of getting of having Achilles tendon injury because about 30% have an Achilles tendon injury, whereas 70% of them have are running without injury. And so what this is telling us is that if you have 12 or 14 G, uh, GT repeats in your tenacious C gene, you're much more likely to get an Achilles tendon injury. We don't know yet whether the 12 or 14 uh, the people with 12 or 14 GT repeats, are they the ones who are stiff at the beginning? Are they the ones who are less stiff at the beginning? We have very little understanding as to how the tenacency polymorphism is actually going to be connected with, with performance. We do know about the injury though, and the injury is, is quite striking. Another one is collagen 5, and I showed you that collagen 5 is one of the genes that goes up significantly when we do heavy loading. And there's a specific polymorphism called the A1 variant. And the A1 variant of, uh, of collagen 5, people with the A1 variant of collagen 5 here, um, have 50% greater risk of developing Achilles tendon injuries than those who have the A2 or the A3. Okay, so, so basically, this is the, the black bar is the, is the one is the, is the number of individuals with that genotype. So about 70% of individuals have the A1 variant, about 30% have, um, have the A2, and only a small um, number have the A3. And what you can see is that the rate of the frequency of Achilles tendon injury or tendonitis or tendon pain is greater with the A1 than it is with either the A2 or the A3. Again, this is work coming from George McConey um, from his PhD work. And so what this is showing us is that, um, that depending on which genes you've got, there's collagen one polymorphisms that um, make you more prone to ACL ruptures. So there's very, and this seems to be a much tighter relationship between changes in genes specific small changes in genes and injury rate than there is as far as changes in genes with performance. We don't see genes that correlate very well with performance. We see genes that correlate very well with, um, with injury though. Okay, so altogether what this data is telling us is that, is that changes in genes to say tenacin C, collagen 5, collagen 1 are going to potentially increase or decrease. If you have the A2 variant, there's 30% of people with A2 variant, but only 10% of the uh, people with the A2 variant who have Achilles tendonitis or Achilles tendon pain. So what that means is you're less represented as far as having Achilles tendon pains, okay? So overall, um, there these genes in tenacin C is a mechanically activated gene. Uh, and so that means when we load, we increase it. Collagen 5, the same way I showed you that. But if you've got these different polymorphisms, it's possible that the loading response is, is impaired and you develop, instead of developing a, an adapted system, which is better suited to, to handle the load, you actually develop a, a pathogenic system, which is less developed for handling the load. So what we need to know, do you need to do genetic analysis? No, by the time an athlete comes to any of us, anybody who's going to be on a team, if they're going to have a genetic phenotype, they're going to already have an injury history. And that injury history is going to be clear whether you know exactly which gene is, is driving that or not. Okay, so, so really when we're, looking at, when we're looking at improving economy, what we're looking to do is we're looking to take the genetics that we have. If we have somebody who's got a, a big uh, injury history, we're going to assume that they've probably got some of these genetic factors and what we're going to do is we're going to train to protect the injury, but we can still train it with enough plyometric work that we can improve performance when we need to improve performance. Because if you go back to the Pavlovian study, the biggest change in, in running economy happened over the first three weeks. So that means that we don't have to do plyometric training year-round, 
we can do the plyometric training and we can use that plyometric training as a way to sharpen when we get closer to performance time or when high performance is, is the goal.